I'm sure we've all been to a county fair or carnival at least once in our life. It's a place where we can let loose and enjoy all types of fun. With everything from rides and good food to games and stuffed animals, there seems to be something for everyone. It's hard to believe that a county fair could be the setting of a chilling, unsolved crime. The year was 1986, and 14-year-old Jeremy Donald Bright was an average teen living in Grants Pass, Oregon. He was described as bright and energetic. The freckle-faced 14-year-old spent most of his free time drawing, which was one of his favorite hobbies. He was a big kid for his age, already reaching a height of 6 foot with a size 13 shoe. He made sure to use this to his advantage, though. Jeremy was an active kid and heavily involved in school sports. He lived in Grants Pass with his mother, Diane, and younger sister, Esty, who was 10 years old. The family had previously lived about two hours north in Myrtle Point, Oregon. After Jeremy's mother and stepfather split up, she sought out a new start for the three in Grants Pass. One event that Jeremy always looked forward to was the Coos County Fair back in Myrtle Point. He made it a point to attend the fair every summer, but with the recent move, he was afraid that he'd miss the festivities that year. Jeremy would soon learn that his stepfather, Orville Goseth, had made plans for he and his sister to spend a week with him in Myrtle Point. This would give Jeremy a chance to attend the fair and catch up with some childhood friends. When Jeremy arrived in Myrtle Point, he couldn't have been happier. For him, this trip would be the highlight of his summer. He was eager to see one friend in particular, Johnny Fish. The two had been close before Jeremy moved, so it seemed that the two were looking forward to hanging out that week. Of course, Jeremy and Johnny's agenda included the Coos County Fair. It was on Wednesday, August 13th that the two would head out to the fair for a night of fun and entertainment. Earlier that day, Jeremy had spoken with his mother via payphone and made plans for her to pick him and Esty up that Friday. He'd also made a visit to a local tavern owned by his grandmother. It was here that he'd meet with his stepfather, Orville. Orville gave Jeremy a few bucks to attend the fair the following day, and soon, the two parted ways. On Thursday, August 14th, Jeremy would head out to the Coos County Fair once more, this time accompanied by his younger sister. It was around 2 p.m. when Jeremy and Esty split up. They made plans to meet each other at 5 p.m. near the Ferris wheel. Esty got there at the agreed time, but Jeremy never showed. Esty's instincts told her something wasn't right. She flagged down a police officer and explained that her brother was nowhere to be found. The police officer, believing Jeremy was still roaming the fairgrounds, told Esty to head home and he was sure her brother would be home eventually. Well, by the next morning, Jeremy still hadn't arrived home. His stepfather assumed that he'd stayed the night with a relative or a buddy. Crimes weren't too common in Myrtle Point, and the community was close-knit, and mostly everyone knew one another. So Orville left to work believing his son would arrive home at some point during the day. Later that afternoon, Diane arrived at Myrtle Point as planned. When she got to Orville's home, she expected to find Jeremy waiting for her. Instead, she found Jeremy's watch, his wallet, and his set of keys to their home in Grants Pass. But there was no Jeremy. Much like Orville, Diane assumed that Jeremy must have been at a friend's house. Maybe he'd overslept or was simply running late. Either way, Diane didn't panic initially. She began to ask around town to see if anyone knew where her son was. Diane spoke with family members and reached out to Jeremy's friends. No one had seen him since the day before. This is when Diane began to worry. She contacted Myrtle Point Police and officially reported her son missing. An investigation began and at first, law enforcement believed foul play was to blame. This changed about a week later when sightings of Jeremy were reported to police. Some of these sightings were said to have taken place as late as August 17th, three days after Jeremy vanished from the fairgrounds. As a result of these reports, investigators began to suspect that Jeremy ran away with the traveling carnival, that maybe he'd been unhappy with the recent move to Grants Pass and wanted to get away. These claims were highly disputed by his family and friends, though. With Myrtle Point being such a low crime area, police were optimistic and believed Jeremy was somewhere out there unharmed. During this time, several rumors began to circulate regarding Jeremy's disappearance. 
One of these rumors claimed that Jeremy went to a party that day and ingested an illegal drug, resulting in a fatal overdose. Another claimed that Jeremy had accidentally been shot during some sort of target practice in the woods. The person who gave this tip was a prison inmate. He said Jeremy's body would be buried near a cabin in a remote wooded area. When this location was searched though, there was no signs of Jeremy. Cecilia Fish, the sister of Jeremy's friend Johnny Fish, reported that on the night of Jeremy's disappearance, she saw a man run into the entryway of their apartment building. According to Cecilia, the man was covered in blood. Unfortunately, she was unable to see his face or any other distinctive features. One of the most interesting tips came from a few people that had actually been at the fairgrounds that day. They reported seeing a man forcibly move Jeremy somewhere near the Ferris wheel around 1.30 p.m. One of these tipsters happened to be Jeremy's sister, Esty. For whatever reason, nothing ever came of these reports. At one point, tips led investigators to Florida, where a young man named Jeremy Bright was said to have been working for a circus company. However, this turned out to be a different person with the same name. As time went on, there would be even more reports that led to nothing. Myrtle Point and its surrounding areas had been flooded with missing persons posters and billboards. Still, no one could say for certain what happened to Jeremy Bright. In January of 1989, Jeremy's story would air on the popular TV series Unsolved Mysteries. A new show at the time, Unsolved Mysteries documented various unsolved crimes in hopes of assisting ongoing investigations. After the show aired, investigators would get their first break in the case. They now had a main suspect, and his name was Terry Lee Steinhoff. Terry Lee Steinhoff was a fellow resident of Myrtle Point. About a week after the Unsolved Mysteries episode aired, he was arrested for stabbing and killing 32-year-old Patricia Morris. What's compelling about Steinhoff is that he'd actually babysat Jeremy Bright in the past, and some reports claim that Jeremy had been in Steinhoff's truck the day he went missing. Steinhoff eventually pled guilty and was sentenced to prison for Patricia Morris's death, but when questioned about Jeremy Bright's case, he refused to talk. Terry Lee Steinhoff would ultimately die of a heroin overdose in 2007. It's never been proven that he had anything to do with Jeremy's case. Some Myrtle Point residents suspect that Johnny Fish had some part in Jeremy's disappearance. Johnny was one of the few people to see Jeremy in the days before he vanished. Although the two were friends, is it possible that there was a dispute between them that turned violent? Or maybe Johnny wasn't involved but knew more than he was letting on. It's said that in the years following his friend's disappearance, Johnny was never the same. He suffered from frequent nightmares and had trouble sleeping. When asked about those last days with Jeremy, he would often say the memories had been blacked out. Ultimately, Johnny would develop an alcohol addiction. He passed away in 2011. It's been almost 35 years since Jeremy Bright went missing. If still alive today, he'd be 48 years old. It's felt by some that police didn't take Jeremy's case serious at first, causing valuable time to be wasted and possibly allowing a perpetrator to escape justice. After all, Jeremy's sister, along with others, reported seeing a strange man being rough with Jeremy the day he went missing. Could that man have done something to Jeremy? In August of 2011, his family held a service in his memory. At this point, they presumed Jeremy had passed away. As recent as 2016, there have been searches conducted for Jeremy in the Myrtle Point area, but these yielded no results. This case is a mysterious one for sure. Maybe one day we'll find out what really happened to Jeremy Bright. <laughs>